Hi everyone. Welcome to this M2D Tech Talk. Our today's speakers are Leon Hazel and Simon Boom. Leon Hazel is a PhD student at the Technical University of Munich under the joint supervision of Prof. Fabien Thies and Stefan Gunnerman. His background is in physics and mathematics, and previously um, he co authored paper in the field of quantum information and computer vision. He now works on model for single cell perturbation and special transmitomy, focusing on probabilistic and generative machine learning in particular. Simon is a graduate in, uh, <clears throat> is a master graduate from the computer science um, department at the University of ETH Zurich. Um, during his undergrad, he published research on normalizing flow and conditional density estimation. Previously, he also worked as a software engineer at AMD at Enconco, building compiler for machine learning and deep learning efforts. The work that they're representing today is part of Simon's um, master thesis when during his stay at the uh, Technical University of Munich. Thank you so much, Leon and Simon, for accepting to present your work here today. And uh, yeah, you can jump right in. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, because I was told that I might be lagging, I will now turn off my video. I'm very um, glad to be presenting today um, our work uh, on chemical CPA or short chem CPA and with a paper title predicting cellular responses to novel drug perturbations at a single cell resolution. Um, Simon and I will switch a bit who is presenting. So I will first start with the introduction because like giving a short overview of a single cell genomics and perturbation modeling. Simon will then um, show you the model architecture of CAMP CPA. And then I will again discuss a bit about the data sets because perturbation modeling is actually quite challenging. And uh, towards the end, we will show you the results we are actually um, also showing in the paper. And I have to apolog uh, apologize because I still haven't updated the archive version. So in case you have checked what's uh, public already, um, the NeurIPS version, um, like over NeurIPS, that's the updated version and the archive version is still the preprint. So um, yeah, let's get right into it. So single cell and um, perturbation modeling. So, so in Fabian Tice's lab, we, yeah, historically we, we dealt with single cell genomics data and um, we are asking questions um, towards the direction of understanding the cellular under health and disease. And if you look at cells, uh, there might be different processes going on. So one of which might be that, yeah, the cell um, under some condition A survives and nothing really changes. Uh, under some other conditions, it might differentiate and the cell state might change. Um, it might proliferate vision or it could also just die. So the question we're asking is, can we understand such a system and um, can we actually even predict its behavior? So put very simply in mathematical terms, we understand this if we have like some cellular state, X old, um, and we have some, some conditions P, can we find a function F to, to predict the new state? And the, the measurements, the data modality, we are usually dealing with are single cell observations. So often like the most abundant data resource is actually like single cell RNA-seq data or like, yeah, at least in our case, um, but, but there's actually more to it. So like uh, on the omics scale, you might look also at the genome level, at the epigenome level, at the protein level or at the metabolome. So like there's a whole scale to this and actually also um, towards the tissue you're looking at, are you looking at organs, for example, with new um, atlases uh, coming up um, there are different levels at which we can understand such living systems. And um, actually there's a third axis, which is very important um, for research and uh, that of perturbation. And perturbation again can lie at, or can come from different uh, sources. For example, today we are mostly focused, we're actually focusing on drugs only, but there might be gene knockouts, um, there might be uh, developmental data, so time plays a role, disease just in general, like there are different perturbations to um, the system. 
So while looking at single cells, so there's actually nice uh, graphics of this um, um, where we have like here, uh, a horse, uh, a rhino and a duck. And at the single cell level, we can actually identify those different entities. But historically, there are also like bulk measurements, which kind of take the mean of everything. So the bulk measurement of this actually is not, uh, I mean, it gives you some information, but it might be misleading. So you, you don't capture all the variability that might be in the single cell data. And uh, to give you an idea how this actually works for, for droplet-based methods, you actually start with gale, gale beads uh, to the left, and then you induce those uh, the individual cells, the single cells to those uh, beads, and then the oil separates them. And this is how we actually get our single cell measurements. Um, so this all started kind of in 2013, uh, being nature's method of the year. And then um, there was multimodal, something I already like said that you could potentially like um, in multi ohm data, you also have attack information uh, in, in, uh, together with RNA. Um, so this was method of the year 2019. And then in 2020, even with spatially resolved transcriptomics, so that you not only um, have the RNAs, but you actually also know their location. And over the time, and this is actually very important for machine learning, um, the abundance of the data has increased quite a lot. So this is actually in the log scale. Um, and now we have data sets which, which have more than one or two million uh, cells, one of which is, for example, the Human Lung Cell Atlas, which was um, at least in its preprint version published this year uh, by a colleague in the TICE lab. But there are also like other very big data sets and also the perturbation data sets we are showing you today um, have quite a few observations. So um, what are the actual trends? And one important, uh, or what's important to mention is that uh, over the past years, there have been uh, more and more methods coming up. And recently, I think, yeah, in 2021, uh, it hit the 1000 uh, uh, methods. And a colleague in, in the TIES lab actually analyzed all those GitHub repositories and uh, checked for, for keywords. And perturbation actually is one of the um, uh, keywords that's coming up uh, over proportionally. So there's uh, two things you can see, like there's a, the increased data abundance leads to um, more interest from the also the machine learning community and within um, that interest, there's definitely also perturbation data. So what are actually uh, ob objectives for perturbation modeling? And um, I hope that you can, can see my cursor because otherwise it might be a bit difficult to follow, but, but this is a, a nice overview slide from a, from a review that uh, Hugo published last week, uh, not last week, last year on perturbation modeling. And uh, she, she defined uh, different objectives you might have. So coming from these omics measurements, um, which, which might be RNA or um, ataxic, um, there's, there's this part of perturbation responses. So like often this is in an autoencoder based fashion, something that we also do. Um, you try to understand the perturbations in somewhat of a latent space, you reconstruct and you measure performance. Um, on top of that, and this is very like these, um, this is very abundant for, for bulk data sets are scalar readouts, for example, like IC50, um, which gives you an idea about the, the influence of a drug on a, on a cell line or a cell type in general. Um, but this is something um, that we also, in, we could possibly model, but we don't focus on this because we are, we are more on this omics side. Um, on top of that, and this is also very in, um, important to understand uh, the, the perturbations a drug might induce, is to identify targets and mechanisms. So in this um, example, you see each dot is a, is a drug and you have uh, in the different colors indicate uh, different targets and mecha mechanisms or modes of action. And then you have a new compound and you might, you might ask, okay, what's the, what's the mode of action here? And 
then there are, and this is, for example, very important for cancer therapy, um, you, you look at combinations of drugs. So like here, each axis is, is a drug and you might um, ask, are these, uh, with respect to potency, are these synergistic or antagonistic? And um, so for example, the potency you see here, um, the two drugs are synergistic because like the, um, the six, um, the lowest point is actually lower than before. Um, so before you combine those drugs, it's higher. Um, here it's antagonistic because uh, the total efficacy is, is reduced. And here you see the respective um, uh, antagonistic effects on the left. And lastly, and this is something uh, that's I think very ambitious, but also would be super cool to solve is like going the other way around, not just so giving given a chemical compound, um, predicting its impact on the on the omics side. This is what we do in CAMCK, but also going the other way around that you have like an omics measurement, um, could be RNA, could be single cell attack, and say something about the required chemical properties um, that might induce such a perturbation. Okay, with that um, primer, we are actually addressing, um, in, in CAMCPA, we are addressing the perturbation response modeling and also this uh, second part with respect to um, characterizing unseen compounds. Um, we don't deal with combinations yet, although um, a newer code version will support this, and I'm actually testing this right now. And uh, I think we, we are taking a a good step towards this last part where we at least um, relate chemical structure, which is which its influence on the um, omics perturbation. So with that, um, let us discuss the, the model itself. Okay, so I'll cover the model part. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll go over the model first and then afterwards we'll talk about the data sets and then cover the actual experiments which validate multiple parts of the model, which might sound, uh, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, the basic thing that we've also roughly highlighted is this working one second. Here we go. Okay, so the basic uh, thing which um, Leon explained is that we want to model um, perturbations. And uh, specifically, our model is about modeling chemical perturbations, so drug-induced um, perturbations, and we want to be able to uh, answer counterfactual questions. So we want to be able to say, for example, um, we know that this uh, specific cell that we have right here has been perturbed with like drug one, what would the gene expression of this specific cell have looked like uh, had it been perturbed with drug two instead. And so I'll go through how actually we um, make this happen in the model. So the first part of the model is this encoder decoder structure, which takes the uh, drug embedding vector xi as input into the uh, encoder e which compresses it down into a fixed dimensional uh, latent space uh, ZI. Um, so the uh, dimensionality of uh, our gene expression vector varies somewhere between 1,000 and, and 5,000 uh, genes, depending on how many we actually sequence. Um, and the latent space uh, vector is always uh, 32 dimensions. I'm having some troubles here. Okay, here we go. Okay, and um, the next part is the is, uh, is the um, yeah. So the, the next step of trying to answer these counterfactual questions is um, we want to remove any of the information about the drugs or the covariates from this latent space such that we can add them back manually later. And so the way that this works is that we take um, that we take the latent um, dimension, uh, the the latent vector in blue and we feed it to these adversarial classifiers. And so we have two of these adversarial classifiers. One of them takes the Z-basal as input and tries to predict uh, the drug that was applied to the cell. And the other um, classifier takes uh, the same basal state as input and tries to predict uh, the cell type. And so um, we train both of these um, adversarial classifiers on a, on a classification loss across entropy loss. And we add this as a penalty to the loss of the encoder. So what this actually ends up happening and over time through training is that uh, information about the covariates and about the drugs that were applied to the original cell is removed 
from the basal state because the encoder is penalized for having too much information in the basal state that would lead the classifiers to be able to predict which drug was applied to the original uh, cell. So this leads um, uh, this leads to the Z basal, the latent space uh, vector, to become a perturbation-free latent space. We we'll go a bit more in depth later because it's very you have to be very careful on that side um, in order to actually be able to make meaningful um, predictions. So now that we've removed all the information about the drugs and the covariates from the latent space, we can add them back uh, manually. So yeah, so we do it. We have our perturbation-free state ZI, and we add back information about the covariates and information about the drug. And the information about the drug we, um, we, is scaled with um, with the dosage uh, S, which is just a, a scalar. Okay, I'm just skip over here. Sorry, just some delay here. Okay, so uh, this gives us uh, two basic advantages. First, there's no combinatorial explosion if we try to model a lots of drugs because we don't have a bit vector uh, encoding. Um, we just do this latent space ar arithmetic of adding the uh, basal state, which is perturbation free, and then an embedding vector that encodes the cell type, and then an embedding vector that encodes the drug. Um, yeah, and so this, uh, since now we have manual control over this, uh, you should it, it should be. Uh, obvious how it's possible for us to ask these counterfactual questions, right? So we take our perturbed uh, latent space and code it down to the perturbation-free latent space and then add a different drug and run it through the decoder, which maps um, our per new perturbed latent space back to the gene expression uh, state. Okay, and so during training, um, we actually optimize the, uh, the autoencoder structure just for a reconstruction loss giving that the decoder outputs a mean and a variance. Um, and then we have this extra penalization via the adversarial embeddings that I covered earlier. Okay, now we're gonna look a bit at the interesting parts of the model, which is the, the cell line embedding um, and later also the, uh, the drug embedding. So the cell line embedding is fairly straightforward, mainly because the data sets that we had access to had very few um, cell lines. So we just train a, a lookup table um, during training from scratch. And that's how we add information about the, uh, the cell line. Um, and so for the perturbation network, which is the interesting part about the drugs. Um, yeah, so this basically consists of uh, three parts. So on the left side, you see the molecule, the drug molecule that we actually care about. Then we have, um, uh, then we have a, a molecule embedding G, which uh, feeds into a lower dimensional uh, fixed length embedding space, um, which we yeah, which we then feed to a scalar, which uh, outputs a, um, a scaled uh, dosage, uh, which we multiply with the with the DI, which is the embedding of the, the drug. Um, yeah, so we there's we have multiple different options for this uh, molecule encoder G. Um, we I'll talk about this later in the experiment section, uh, the which molecule encoders that we tried and which ones um, work best. But these were pretty extensively pre-trained and then but then remained frozen during training. Um, which allows us to use like both non-differentiable embeddings and like very large transformer models that would be hard to train. Um, yeah, the the uh, purpose of M, this perturbation encoder, is mainly that it maps from an, the unspecific chemical representation, which is the output of the encoder, to our uh, latent space dimension, um, and which allows us to use a lot of different uh, molecule encoders. And lastly, we have this amortized scalar, uh, which uh, yeah, transforms the dosage to its actual like eff effective dose and is good for modeling um, largely nonlinear um, effects of the drug uh, dosage on the actual effect on the cell. Um, so now if we look at the whole architecture as a whole again, I'll quickly go through it again. Um, we have our gene expression uh, vector. I'm going to skip to the next slide here. Yeah, we have our uh, gene expression vector ZI that is fed through the encoder, becomes this perturbation-free latent space because we penalize uh, any information about the drug or about the covariates in the latent space through our adversarial classifiers. Um, now that we've removed the information about the perturbation, we add it back by having a lookup table for the cell lines and by having a perturbation network for the actual drug embedding. Um, yeah, and on the right side, we have these two adversarial classifiers, one of which covers uh, the drug that was added and one of which covers the covariate. 
Okay, so now that we've gone through the model, um, Leon will continue with the data sets, which then later leads us into the experiments. I have a question. Um, I don't understand the difference between G and S networks. Uh, yeah, so G is so G is a molecule and coda that gets. Oh, sorry, but sorry, sorry. Between M and S. Between M and S. Yeah, so S is what we had. S is what S is a scalar because we wanted to model the transformations on the dosage separately, and M is mainly. We mainly added it for the purpose of being able to use a lot of different G's, which some of them have like um, output of 3000 dimensional vector space. Some would be much smaller and we want to be able to feed all of these into our fixed um, dimensional latent space. But, but I don't understand. I thought the dosage was just multiplying this with the Z. So why it, do you need the S network? It is, um, this is, yeah, this is something that we're not 100% certain about whether it's necessary. I don't think we did a lot of ablation studies on this one. Our initial idea was that Maybe. it is better for modeling nonlinearities. Okay. Also, what, what happens because um, in the, the data sets we are considering, you apply the drug in different dosages. And um, I mean, there are very con multiple confounding effects. And if, if this drug potentially doesn't have an effect at all, um, this dosage scalar would be able to um, basically scale everything to zero, um, which you wouldn't be able to if you just multiplied the raw dosage that you're applying the drug with. So, so, so you're saying you either use M or S. With M, you just multiply by the scalar dosage. With S, you may have some arbitrary nonlinear transformation that depends on S. Exactly. OK, got it. Thanks. Yeah, and one potential um, application of, of this and is also that you put, can get a dose response curve. So like for, for, for a drug and with this armatized um, scalar, you could look at the learned effective dosage. Okay. Okay, so um, getting to, to the data sets, because um, as I said, like this project is, um, very much in between like data science and, and machine learning and for perturbation modeling, it's quite important that you have some, some idea about the data sets. Um, I, I will now introduce them. So the L1000 data set um, um, has been published or was a large um, effort by, by the Broad Institute um, and had this idea of um, building a large connectivity map for both uh, drug perturbations and also gene perturbations and understanding uh, cellular functions through those uh, perturbations and to facilitate uh, discovery of connection between those different entities. So genes, drugs, and also diseases. Um, so at the time, they also had to uh, consider uh, the cost of such experiments because if you go like large scale, right, like many thousand uh, perturbations, um, it, ha it has to be experimentally feasible, both in time, but also in cost. And so um, on the, for, for their 1,000, um, 978 different landmark genes were chosen um, with respect to uh, two considerations, one of which is that uh, these genes should be somewhat orthogonal to one another, such that you can basically map to a larger gene space from, from, those sub from the subset. And in addition, because um, this uh, data set is hybridization based it ha and you get like fluorescent signals, you have to deconvolve the, the, the image or the flu fluorescent signal that you get. Um, and for this reason, the, the genes were chosen in that way. And the data set actually comes in, in five levels. And if, if you deal with this perturbation data set, you can choose which, whichever level is fitting for you. In our case, it's this uh, second level where the raw fluorescence data has been mapped to um, gene expression values, or like you can at least interpret them as gene expression values, um, of, even though it's not a sequencing-based protocol. So to, to summarize those challenges I've, I've just mentioned, so it's, it is hybridization-based and you have to relate it somewhat to like RNA sequencing data. You have to deconvolve the image signal because um, you have with the same um, color you have in, in one, Played, you have two different genes. 
and also um, in, in total, there are um, actually like about 20,000 different chemical compounds contained, but uh, many of which are randomly generated. So um, they might not have a perturbation effect or the perturbation effect of them is not really well understood. So um, this is um, the, the bulk data set that we are considering for, for the pre-training later on. And then going from bulk to single cell, there has been um, a really nice uh, paper published. Um, it's called SC Perturb. They also have a nice website where different single cell data sets, not just drug, but also uh, gene knockout data sets have been collected and um, analyzed uh, or like looked at uh, in, in the same fashion. And um, they propose this E distance for uh, significant like testing if a perturbation um, has been significant or not. And what's actually quite interesting you, in, in this, you see two regions um, in the bottom, you have many, but rather weak perturbations, at least according to this E distance, which kind of somewhat relates distance in, in um, a PCA space towards variance of a different perturbation, of like one perturbation condition. And in the top, you have um, few perturbations, but, but strong signals. And um, you see that the, the single cell data set, which is the Cyplex 3 data set that we are dealing with, is rather on the side, like for drugs, it's actually many um, perturbations, but it rather has weak, um, if, or like uh, weak perturbation effects. And again, like it's a similar view on this. Um, so you have three different cell lines, it doesn't really matter which one is which, but interestingly, because the, the cells, they have been kind of um, treated the same way across the different cell lines, and it results in different abundances of, of each different cell line because the cell cycle, how long it takes for those cell lines is just different. So like, just to make you aware that if you're dealing with this real data, there are many different um, parts you have to take into account and potentially correct for. So if like just knowing this, and this has been published recently, so I didn't have access to it when I, when we were dealing with chem CPA, but taking a closer look. So <clears throat> here you see um, embeddings of the three different uh, cell lines in the Cyplex 3 data. And the colors are not actually perturbation categories, but just light and clustering on the neighborhood graph of the cells. And, um, but you see some structure. Um, if you naively, and actually I think I, did, I wasn't super naive, um, but if you process the data yourself, you might find that it's very blobby. Um, we can identify that some of those um, epigenetic, because here it's colored by pathway, um, some of those drugs that uh, belong to epigenetic regulation are actually well separated uh, from the rest. And we will see that CAMCP actually also performs quite well on those um, compared to uh, many other pathways being not super well located. I mean, of course, perturbations are rather subtle and this is a rather global view on the data set. So you have to you have to check that, but I just want to show you that perturbation data is actually quite challenging. Um, the summary of this Cyplex 3 data set, we have roughly 650,000 observations, um, 188 drugs across these three different cell lines. And in total um, for the single cell data set, we have about 7,500 uh, genes. So the question that we then have, because I mean, Simon just proposed, like the main novelty comes from this perturbation network and we want to relate chemical structure to its perturbation effect. So how do we now choose such OOD drugs? Um, because we have to choose somewhat strong perturbations, but also Um, test for uh, generalization performance. And for this, um, I looked at the original publication and uh, <clears throat> it's not important that you like can read this, but I did, like what's shown here is for each of those different clusters, like here it's um, the different colors indicate different clusters and here each column is one of this cluster. Um, they did a Fisher test and checked is the abundance of a specific perturbation category 
um, significantly different from just the abundance of control cells. And what is highlighted is actually like the final decision Simon and I made for the OOD drugs. Um, but, and what you, but you can also see in the background that there are actually like quite a few drugs and across cell lines which don't show strong effects. So maybe unlike to um, I said, like classical machine learning tasks where you can just randomly choose your, your test set, you have to be very careful if you do this um, dealing with real data. And the final decision um, was for these nine different drugs. Um, actually, quite a few of them were from this um, histone deacetylation uh, pathway, but we tried to like also in, incorporate like tyrosine kinase signaling, cell cycle, um, on protein folding. So, like to have like somewhat a representative um, test set where we have perturbations, but also uh, going across like different pathways. <clears throat> All right, so then for the transfer learning part, um, as uh, we already indicated, we have these two data sets. One of them is there 1000 and the Cyplex. And the, just in order to check if transfer works, we subset it to the same gene set. So um, using gene ensemble annotations, we were able to identify 977 of um, the landmark genes also in the single cell data. Um, I'm, I think I might have missed one. Um, I think there should be a total overlap, but I think it's fine. So 977 genes, and it's the same between source and target. And for the transfer learning part, we take a pre-trained model and add a linear layer. Um, actually, no, it's not, lin not linear, but like we add a layer to both the encoder and the decoder, and then train the CAMP CPA model um, on the single cell data set. And we call this the extended gene set where we use the same landmark genes from the R1000 in addition to like roughly a bit more than 1000 highly variable genes. And this is actually like, this is the most, like the more challenging setting because of course like transfers like only uh, possible in a limited fashion, but dealing with single cell data, which is like much more sparse compared to the bulk signal, you have to, like, you have to somewhat account for the variance that's in there. Um, coming to the evaluation strategy then for the model. So as um, we, we said before, we call this counterfactual predictions because we can somewhat um, answer this question of what had happened if we treated cell X with drug Y. Um, and for, for evaluation, we only encode different control cells and then add whatever attributes you're interested in. So like um, I indicate by color, the cell line and by this, this drug uh, I can, um, emoji, a different uh, drug, and then we decode it back and compare it to, um, to the original measurement. What our baseline is, is just if, if we completely discard any drug information. So just um, saying, okay, I have this A549 cell line. Um, I pretend this wasn't perturbed at all. So what's what's the performance on this? So like any, basically our baseline indicates, is there actually a signal or not? Or like it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a good indicator for that. And only the, the difference like towards perfect prediction can then actually be attributed to, to a drug. The performance metric is always R2, so because we, we kind of understand this as the regression task, but we um, have two different foci. One, the first one is like the prediction of all the genes, but because there are many genes that might just be constant, um, we also look at the differentially expressed genes. And the way these are computed, you just have to imagine for one perturbation category, you look at the drug and cell, line um, information and compute those 50 genes that are actually um, differentially expressed for this category. So the differentially expressed genes, even though we present them together, they are specific for the drug and cell line. And I think this is very important and you can understand this as a somewhat zoomed in view. But for example, if there's really like an unknown compound, we can only, um, we don't know the differentially expressed genes necessarily. So 
um, we have to take both into account, both this like all gene performance and also the differentially expressed genes on our test set. And then something uh, Simon indicated before, we have this disentanglement criterion um, where we train nonlinear classifiers. Say after CAMCPA has been trained, we evaluate on a new nonlinear classifier how well the cell line information and the drug information is still contained in the space of state. And <clears throat> because like our ob observation was that models usually are not, especially with respect to the cell type information, they are not uh, perfectly disentangled. Um, we, we said the, that if perfectly is disentanglement due, due to the different abundance of the cell lines was 0 0.5, we allowed something until like 0 0.7 um, uh, prediction accuracy. And the, so if, if you don't disent, like don't select carefully with respect to disentangled models, you get some of these conflated effects that you have like information from different cell lines, or if you check on the cell, same cell line that, that uh, it can't be attributed to this um, different attribute vectors that we are learning during training. In the paper, you guys say that, or, or you set different disentanglement thresholds, 7%, 70% with respective optimal. How did you guys arrive at these numbers? Um, the, the optimal values or the, like how we select it? Uh, both if possible. So the optimal values is just um, the most abundant drug or cell line present in the data set. So this um, A549 cell line, for example, is about 50% of the data set. So like we said, like it's disentangled if a classifier says it always predicts the same thing, then it's basically un like uninformed. And the same for the, for the perturbation, which is much lower because it's uh, 3%, I think, like some two to 3% or maybe even less. Um, I can't remember the, the exact details. And the, um, the way we chose the criteria for the model selection was we wanted to be as restrictive as possible, but we also didn't want, um, so if we train like five models um, and we have to discard four of them, uh, that wouldn't be good. So like, I think there's room for improvement in the sense that if you like improving this disentanglement, but this was the best we could do. So we tried to be as restrictive as possible, but still have uh, with reasonable amount of training um, models to to um, report performance values on. Thank you very much. But this was actually a good um, question in the sense that now we can uh, go over to the experience uh, where, where Simon will, will actually start. Okay, so um, <clears throat> in terms of the experiments, we, I'll first cover the uh, molecule encoders. So since I said that there's, um, we don't have very big restrictions on what kind of molecule encoders we can use. Basically, we just need something that can go from a smile string into a fixed length embedding space. So we tried a lot of them. Um, and uh, just to give you a rough overview, this doesn't cover everything that we have in the paper. But uh, one thing we tried was uh, this junction tree uh, VAE, which is an encoder and decoder based on combining molecular motives. Then we have Grova, which is a large transformer-based model, uh, which is pre-trained on a lot of um, molecular prediction tasks. Then sort of our baseline or the simplest model is RDKit, which is just um, a mechanistic uh, transformation. It basically has like hand-coded uh, computation of attributes of the molecules and then combines all these attributes into one fixed length uh, vector, which is how you can transform the small string into a um, fixed length vector, but without having any training. Um, it's just yeah, a mechanistic transformation. And then we also have uh, CPA, which is um, the same model that we have, but without any of the uh, molecular encoding. So it just has a jointly trained uh, lookup table, which doesn't take in any information about the actual drug, but yeah, trains a lookup table, same like we trained the lookup table for the uh, cell lines. Um, some of these uh, models we trained ourselves, uh, some of them like, for example, Grover was already pre-trained uh, from the authors and I list here roughly which uh, data sets that we trained them on. Um, 
as maybe thinking a little bit about the performance um, considerations. So since the Model G is pre-trained, we keep it frozen during ChemCPA training, which makes it much easier. It, only, it means also that we only have to do one forward pass for each of the molecules in, um, in the data set, and then we can keep them stored as a table. Uh, yeah, but these M and S, those are trained from scratch during the pre-training phase and then fine-tuned also during the fine-tuning phase. Um, right there was there's a lot of work to was a lot of work to be done on the original code base to get this actually working on the l1000 um, data set because with i think like 17,000 drugs and more than a million observations it was not quite straightforward um, to get like robust and fast enough training um, for us to be able to fulfill things like the uh, disentanglement requirements that we had that uh, leon talked about so if we look at some of these scores um Leon, can you skip to the next one? There's um, one second. So if, um, yeah, so it turned out that the simplest models were actually performing pretty well. Um, right here on, on this uh, table, we are testing ChemCPA with three different molecules encoders that we first we pre-trained them on our L1000 data set, and then we fine-tuned them on, on Cyplex 3 and then ran the evaluation that Leon uh, just covered before. And so we evaluate these at a pretty high dosage because obviously at low dosages, there's very little effect of most of these drugs. Um, and roughly what we can see is that across all of the embeddings that we're presenting here, the pre-training did help a lot, particularly uh, on getting better predictions on the differentially expressed genes. Um, yeah, so we yeah, so we have the mean of R2 across all of the genes, and then um, we have the mean of the R2 across the differentially expressed genes, which is, uh, as we covered, those are the genes that vary, vary the most, and those are because most genes, uh, the drugs will not affect, like the gene expression of most genes, so the differentially expressed genes are the ones that you actually care about, but they will also have a lower R2 score since they are harder to predict since they vary much, much more. Um, yeah, so pre-training seems to help across all of the embeddings, um, but uh, our DKID, even though it is much simpler and much, much easier to run, ended up um, working best out of all of the models. So that's what we went with for most of the uh, uh, experiments that we did afterwards. So that is um, contrasting the different molecule encoders. And now I'll talk a bit about comparing to other models that have a different structure from ChemCPA. Um, so ChemCPA is based, um, yeah, um, as we mentioned, it, it models these perturbations through our pre-trained molecule embeddings, and it's based on uh, oh the middle. So the model in the middle is called uh, CPA. We have an error in the slides. So uh, sorry, so yeah, typo. CPA um, models these perturbation uh, as a lookup table, which is trained from scratch, which means that it has no way of having uh, pre-existing information about the molecules encoded into its embedding. Um, and it also can't model any out of distribution drugs because it only has the drugs that it has in the lookup table. And then we also compare to SCGen, which is an uh, auto encoder based models um, that models perturbations via um, arithmetic in the latent space. Okay, so it's sort of not quite straightforward to compare these because SCGen doesn't explicitly model a dosage, which means we can't model different dosages with it. Um, CPA, since it has this lookup table, cannot model any unseen drugs. Um, and ChemCPA is much more flexible because it has explicitly models the dosage. And also, we can, in theory, model arbitrary smile strings. And so, but to compare them, we had to compare them at one fixed dosage uh, value and with uh, only one drug cell line combination being unseen. So we would train. Um, on multiple drugs, but hold out one combination of drug and cell line. And C, uh, CPA can model those because it has seen the drug and it has seen the cell line. It has just not seen the combination of the two. So it's uh, yeah. So it's still a valid uh, validation task. So if we look at the outcome of the performance on top here, we have a lower dosage. At the bottom we have higher dosage. Um, yeah, we compare all these to the baseline, which doesn't have any information about the, the drug. And we see that already uh, ChemCPA without any pre-training um, performs better than uh, CPA and the other existing models. So this is just the gain that you get from using um, a molecule embedding and having much more information about the drugs that you actually apply to the cells. And then in, um, it gets better if you apply pre-training, particularly on the differentially expressed genes, 
which tend to be the ones that you care the most about. Okay, so now um, Leon will talk more about actually uh, applying ChemCPA to model unseen drugs in the data set. Exactly. So um, as Simon just said, it wasn't really unseen before. It was just the combination that hasn't been seen. But what I um, said when I was uh, talking about the, the data sets and how we chose those OOD drugs, now they are truly OOD. So like um, during training and model selection validation, those drugs have never been seen and we are um, evaluating the performance on those. And I'm presenting here like the kind of aggregated results um, across different dosages for a pre-trained ChemCPA model on L1000 and it's a non-pre-trained version when it's just trained on the single cell data. And you see that like basically throughout that uh, the, the pre-trained version works better. Um, we also observe that um, it converges, like it, it gets better disentanglement scores. And uh, so overall, like it's more robust and performs better. Um, and something you can then do, of course, is because this is aggregated, uh, you can look at uh, the, the results for like individual drugs. Um, I'm presenting here like a selection of, of three two of which um, Dafinostat and Givinostat are part of this like violet cohort of um, histone deacetylation. Um, the middle one, you see that the, it's still okay-ish, I guess it's not too bad. Um, the the pre-trained CAMCPA model being slightly better, but um, the difference is not as, as big. So in this case, um, this was like the, the shared gene set where, where the source and target genes are both this 977 um, and yeah we kind of established okay so transfer works and then something I guess which is really good about this compositional latent space is that you can actually query it in a sense and ask for um, how do these drug embeddings uh, cluster and this is a UMAP visualization and um, I mean in line with the original publication and where they, they saw effects, you see that those um, histone deacetylation drugs are actually clustered well together. Some of them are different parts of this latent space, but this is also if you again check um, <clears throat> the original publication, not all of them had this like very strong and similar effect. So um, there are some of them clustered. We also have maybe here clustering towards cell cycle and here a yeah, it's a bit more diffused, I would say. Like, I, I don't dare to make strong, strong uh, statements about this, but like maybe clustering towards uh, the tyrosine kinase segment. But just this is really to illustrate um, we are quite aware that the cyplex, even though it's like the, I guess, state of the art single drug experiment on single cell data, is very limited. And um, you, um, it, it kind of showcases what you can do with this model. And something I find very important um, also, because if you just look on the on the left side, uh, you might conclude wrong things. Um, it's always important to have like some idea of like uncertainty score. And here, um, and this, this is a heuristic, which is based on like just the K nearest neighbors and their pathway level information together with some distance um, weighting. Um, and it's highlighted through this gradient. So kind of highlighting Whereas this, in which regions of this like drug perturbation space is um, Chem CPA confident about its prediction? Where is it not confident? And um, so, so you see here is this high confidence region, and here it's very like uncertain. I would say so. Like whenever the model predicts a perturbation embedding in this region, I would be rather skeptical um, about its prediction performance. Um, the final experiment was then done um, on this extended gene set, and as expected, the overall performance decreases. Like on this, on the whole gene set, which is now larger, right? Like um, this is somewhat hard to compare to to the previous one. Um, again, the the conclusions are ident identical, though MCPA in its pre-trained version performs the best. But here. Um, it's hard to do any like drug specific statements. And the more important part is again, this differentially expressed genes part, which are now um, differentially expressed genes that 
very likely don't originate from this L1000 gene set. So like they are rather originate from, from this part. So which genes that hasn't been seen before, even during pre-training. And looking at the same, at the same drug, um, uh, same three drugs, we see again, good performance on the differentially expressed genes for those two um, drugs from the histone deacetylation pathway. An okay performance, I would say on this drug, but uh, definitely there are some, some, I didn't plot it here, but like there's also, there are drugs where CAMCPA just fails. So um, this is somewhat expected um, and uh, um, things that happen. Now to conclude um, this talk, I will briefly summarize like the, the different um, insights we got through this model and our experiment section. So one thing, I think we have shown is that um, CAMCPA effectively leverages the chemical priors. So like, and also that molecular fingerprints are, even though they're easy, compute, easy to compute, they provide competitive performance. Um, this is something we have seen um, also in different projects on spatial transcriptomics data um, that more complex models not necessarily bring better performance. Um, something, that's quite nice, I find, in CAMCPAs. It's very easy to transfer information across data sets. So like you can train on one data set and then you um, transfer this information in an automated fashion. Um, and those, something we've seen in the, the final bit that those pre-trained models, even for unseen drugs, if there's support in the data, um, consistently outperform their non-pre-trained version. And actually there is a benefit from the L1000 data despite uh, technological differences. Um, very briefly, of course, this is not the end and um, there are still open questions. One of which might be that this like simple addition in the latent space might not be the best, um, the best idea. So like um, there are no papers on like optimal transport based methods. So potentially this might be a direction to go. Um, something we said and would potentially be possible to think like a junction tree via E model or like any molecule generation model, like going from omics to compounds. Um, I guess something that's interesting with the SE Perturb study where put the pre-processing has been, I guess, uh, identical throughout like all the single cell data sets, like combining data sets and looking if they're consistent um, perturbations across different data sets. The support for combinations, this is something we haven't shown, but will definitely become with a new um, update on the code base. And of course, something we haven't dealt with at all is like including priors for genetic perturbations, um, because like whatever we did with respect to drugs is not like easily applicable also to the genetic perturbations because they are quite different from um, drug perturbations. So with this, um, I would like to thank you for, for listening. We have listed all the authors um, of this paper and our information in the background. You see the lab, the TICE lab um, at our recent hackathon. And yeah, thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you so much for the, for the great presentation. Um, time for questions. If you have any questions, please just open your mic and fire up. There's one question in the chat by Bradley. Maybe we can start with this one. Uh, should, should I read it? Yes, please read it. Um, in my, I would expect that it would provide better generalizability, thus better performance. Um, I'm not sure. To be honest, like I, I doubt, like both Simon and I um, dealt with junction tree VIE and like also different projects. I think the main limitation at the moment is not so much what the machine, lo uh, machine learning models can do, but actually what the data supports. Like whatever we show is like very much limited to what there is in the original data. So it might be that the chemical embeddings that you get from junction tree VAE are 
potentially richer. I, I wouldn't doubt that, but um, this mapping to the, the perturbation latent space, um, um, mapping to the perturbation latent space would is definitely dependent on the data you're training your model on. So um, I guess that's potentially also the reason why our DKIT performs so well, because um, this is not the bottleneck with respect to performance. There's another question in the chat. Uh, chat. What do you think about the interpretability of CAMP CPA? Um, I think it's actually quite good. Like it's a flexible model, like assuming that everything works, right? And, and the disentanglement works and you get, um, you can really attribute uh, performance to um, the different embeddings you're training. I think it's quite good because from a biological perspective, you have control over what you are doing. Um, you're not just like, because of course we, we train towards performance, but then I think it's the, the perturbation latent space. That's very interesting um, to uh, investigate on. And for example, something with, even if it's a heuristic, this uncertainty score, I find also very important that you have an idea about different um, regions in this latent space. Nope, um, answers the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, so I have a question about the pre-train. Did you do anything to prevent information leak? Because I think you have a model called Grover that is not only pre-trained on the kind of kind of structure, but also some, on some uh, uh, property prediction task. So did you investigate the task uh, that is involved? Uh, are there any similar tasks that that that, that are involved in in in, in your fine tuning study? Uh, so, uh, so do you, I yeah. think so. The Grover yeah. models were not, at least to my knowledge, trained on any other single cell um, data sets. But uh, maybe some kind of uh, property prediction are involved in some uh, critical pathways. So yeah, but that, that 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 can be used but to facilitate that, the training. Yeah, but wouldn't that just add more information about the actual part, like the way that the drug works, into the Molecular embedding, like I would see that that's an advantage, right? Not a, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. But suppose you have a new marker coming in, it's not um, represented well in the pre-training data set, and it causes issue for generalization. You mean if you have an if a new drug that's not represented in Grover's training data set? Right. Yeah. Not that. I mean, that's definitely that. That's definitely a problem, right? So, but th that's also why Grover. In, uh, why originally I would have thought that Grover would. Like vastly outperformed the other stuff because it was just trained on a much wider variety of drugs. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, as Leon already mentioned in the tests, it sort of became apparent that the limiting factor are the data sets because even something that's like much simpler, like RDK, works just as well as the much more complicated models. Mm -hmm.